Hello, divers. Coming to you from Studio D, this is the Deep Dive Microcast, a brief look into things I find interesting, and I hope you do too. I'm Tom Feeney, Bracken Tour, haunted house painter, and writer for Wang's Chop Movie Magazine. In this edition of the Deep Dive Microcast, we celebrate Pride Month by telling the tale of the first made-for-TV movie that presented a gay couple in a sympathetic light and not fodder for crude humor or ridicule. This is the story of the 1972 film That Certain Summer. Before we talk about the movie itself, it's worth looking at the state of LGBTQ representation in the media at the time. Spoiler alert, it wasn't great. For the majority of the 20th century, homosexuals were portrayed as two-dimensional stereotypes, and more often than not, the character's sexuality was only implied, not stated outright, so as not to offend audiences. The topic was simply not discussed with any respect or intelligence. By the late 1960s, change was on the horizon. Change the gay and lesbian community had to literally fight for every step of the way. Only three years before that certain summer premiered on television, the mainstream media was still treating homosexuals like they were somehow less than human beings. That would begin to change after the Stonewall Riots. In 1969, New York City police raided the Stonewall Inn, a gay club located in Greenwich Village. Gay clubs at the time were routinely raided by police, but this time the patrons fought back, leading to six days of protests and violence. The Stonewall riots had the effect of kick-starting the gay liberation movement of the late 1960s. A year after the Stonewall riots, the first gay pride marches took place in multiple cities. It was in this less-than-tolerant climate that the ABC television network aired that certain summer in prime time. But one thing we should address before we get into the story of how this film got off the ground. What is the movie about, and why was it so controversial? Well, describing it now you'd be hard-pressed to find anything even remotely objectionable about it at all. The late, great Hal Holbrook plays a contractor named Doug Salter, who lives and works in San Francisco. He's divorced and has a 14-year-old son, Nick, played by Scott Jacoby, who lives with his mom in Los Angeles. Nick will be spending part of the summer with his dad, but doesn't yet know his father is gay. I guess you'll get married again to somebody. What brings us out? Nothing, just thinking. I'd like to see you and Mom get together again. Yeah, I know. You won't, though. Well, if you do find somebody, do what you want to do. Don't worry about me. Nick, if it means anything, I don't think I'll be getting married again. Why? Oh, a lot of reasons. Very complicated. We'll talk about it sometime. That means when I'm older, right? That's right. That's what I thought. Doug wrestles with having to come out to his son during their time together. Complicating matters is Doug's longtime partner, Gary, played by veteran actor Martin Sheen. Nick, it's a friend of mine, Gary McClain. Hi, how are you? Hello. Well, I hope you guys are hungry. Oh, he hasn't had anything to eat for at least an hour. I think we can take care of that. Dad, uh, aren't the two of us going to eat dinner together? Sure. I uh, invited Gary to join us. That's okay, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, I... 
to take out the takeout. Gary agrees to temporarily move out of the house he and Doug share while Doug's son is visiting. The three begin spending time together, and young Nick notices how close the two men are. Now, Gary is out, but Doug is still apprehensive about revealing his sexuality to anyone outside his circle of friends. This leads to some friction between the couple. I was ashamed they wouldn't be living this way. Maybe, but it takes some of us a while sometimes to come all the way out. I am out. Okay. But then why aren't you being honest with Nick? What am I supposed to do? Sit him on my knee like something out of Andy Hardy? Confess to him? Gary, I love that boy. What's the point of confusing him? He's just a kid. He's a pretty bright kid, Doug. Bright enough to handle something like this? You don't think so? Why, sure, they're more sophisticated these days. They grow up faster, but Nick... He may not be ready. Eventually, Nick makes a discovery that shocks him, and he runs away before his dad can explain. Nick's mother arrives at Doug's home looking for Nick after getting a distressing phone call from the boy. She finds Doug's partner, Gary, at the house, and tensions rise. Mr. McLean, where is Nick? We don't know. All right, what happened? Uh, nothing, nothing happened. Um, Doug got up this morning and Nick wasn't here. We've been looking for him ever since. Nick called me. Really? He didn't sound very happy. He said he might want to come home early and you say nothing happened? I know this is very difficult for you, Mrs. Salton. Do you? It's no less difficult for any of us. Has Doug lost his mind? What right has he got to bring Nick into something like this? Something like what? You know, I don't exactly enjoy sneaking out the back door with my suitcase. Now, maybe that doesn't cut any ice with you, Mrs. Salter, but I happen to live here, too. You've established your credentials. Have I? I don't think so. You need a ring or a marriage certificate for that. If I were a woman, everything would be acceptable, wouldn't it? If you were a woman, I'd know how to compete with you. After Doug, Gary, and Doug's ex-wife search and locate Nick, the father and son have a heart-to-heart -heart talk about what it means to be gay. If there was any way for me not to have this conversation, I wouldn't. You ran away because something was happening that you didn't understand. That was my fault. I should have talked to you. But I guess I was running away myself. Do you know what the word homosexual means? I think so. You probably heard about it in school or in the streets. Most people, I guess, think it's wrong. They say it's a sickness. They say it's something that has to be cured. If I had a choice, it's not something I'd pick for myself. But it's the only way I can live. Gary and I have a kind of a marriage. We... I don't want to talk about it. Nick, we love each other. Damn it, look at me. Does that change me so much? In an ambiguous ending, Nick returns home with his mother, confused and not sure how to feel about his dad's revelation. Now, this all may seem pretty tame by today's standards, but in 1972, it was pretty revolutionary. At the time, it was quite possible that a 14-year-old would have never heard the term homosexual, much less understood the implications. So how did this movie ever get made in that kind of climate, much less be broadcast to millions of viewers? As you can probably guess, it wasn't easy. Let's hear from the screenwriter, William Link, during a 2002 interview 
for the Archive of American Television. To get that on in 1972, I mean, because you just had, you know, cops going in and raiding gay bars in Greenwich Village. I mean, gays were still being, you know, persecuted. It was terrible. Uh, they didn't have any civil rights. They were looked down upon. I mean, they were ostracized. It was terrible. We knew a gay director friend uh, on the lot. We went over to his uh, office. Don Driver, his name was. He's not with us anymore. He died of AIDS, uh, which I find tragic. And we were going to lunch with Don, and it was this little freckled kid sitting in the office. And I said to the secretary, who's the young boy? And she said, oh, that's Don's son. We knew he'd previously been married somewhere in the Midwest. And the son came out to visit his dad. We came out, and I said to Dick, I said, boy, there's a drama. Uh, you see it right there. There's the whole kernel of it. Oh, and he said, yeah, but you can never do it for television. Link and co-writer Richard Levinson first believed the story could also work as an off-Broadway play, but they decided to at least try to get a TV network to back the controversial project. Took to NBC, and they said, we wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole, get out of here. An assistant of Barry Diller's came into our office not that long after and said, you know, Barry's the head of ABC Movies, and he's really looking for good stuff, offbeat. And we said, well, we've got this idea. We told him the idea, and he said, you know, Barry might be interested in that idea. We took it to him, and he loved it. And he said, let's do it. I said, you know, he said Barry, this is going to be, he said, I'll get it through this network by hook or by crook, I'll get it through this network. Well, I got to tell you, he will always have a soft spot in my heart. He fought his own network to get that picture on. It wasn't long before word got around about the project. And of course, there were certain elements that tried to dissuade ABC Movies president Barry Diller from making the film. The two psychologists from my hometown, Philadelphia, were terrible people, maligning gay people to Diller. Diller was sweating. I mean, it was awful. If it sounds odd that psychologists would behave that way, keep in mind that, at the time, homosexuality was still listed as a mental disorder by the American Psychiatric Association. Before production even began, ABC executives forced Lincoln Levinson to make certain changes to the script that they were not necessarily comfortable with. They made us make changes. We knew we were going to have to make changes because standards and practices were running for the hills. But this one, this one came down the turnpike. Uh, they made us put in a character who represented the average heterosexual American, who, who, who stood up for family and homosexuals are weird people. Then we had to have this speech. We fought all these other things and we, and we got away with them. We couldn't really have a kiss or a touch at that time. No way. The fact that maybe the scene would be on the air was anathema enough. Another obstacle that shows just how different the times were. The producers had a difficult time finding actors to play the male lead due to the stigma attached to the gay community. Hal Holbrook was wonderful. Uh, we couldn't get actors to play that role of, of uh, Doug Salter. Uh, I remember Cliff Robertson said, I'd rather play Hitler than play that man. <laughs> Please. Um, and uh, Hal Holbrook read it on his yacht. And he told his son about it. He says, oh, I, I don't know. This is a good script. And the son said, Dad, you'd be a great homosexual. <laughs> Reaction to the film itself was mostly positive, with one major exception. And it came from a place you wouldn't expect. And, and after the picture was on, you know, the homosexual community, the advocate, I think, they put us down. Oh, gays don't feel like that. Or actually, there were plenty of gays who felt like that. If they had their choice, a much better life if they had been born uh, uh, straight. So but we put up a lot. We got a lot of flack after that. Sadly, according to Link, there were also threats of violence. 
And the night it was on, that morning, de uh, uh, bomb threats came in, ABC affiliates. And uh, Barry Diller's whole thing was, we're going to tell the audience in all our ads and promos what this picture is. So they don't want to watch this, watch another channel that night. Despite the difficulties, That Certain Summer aired on the ABC network the evening of November 1st, 1972. The film received many accolades and awards, including a Best Supporting Actor Emmy for young Scott Jacoby as The Sun and Best Television Film by the Golden Globes. Today, That Certain Summer is considered an important milestone in LGBTQ plus media history. The first film to throw away the insults, the tropes, and the degrading gay stereotypes, and give Americans a glimpse at a happy, healthy same-sex couple dealing with a highly personal issue together. The film itself can be hard to locate today, it pops up occasionally on both the streaming platforms Voodoo and Tubi, and sometimes on Turner Classic Movies. It has also been available on YouTube in the past, but was not at the time of this recording. Thanks for listening. If this is the first time you've heard this podcast, check out our past episodes and subscribe so you don't miss a single one. And we want to hear from you. Drop us a line at thedeepdivepodcast@gmail.com or on our Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter feeds. You can find links to all of those and our merchandise store in the bio of our Instagram page. From all of us here at Studio D, which again is just me and my cat, Stay safe and take care. All clips used in the Deep Dive microcast are meant for educational purposes only and not to infringe on existing copyrights. Special thanks goes to the Archive of American Television. The Deep Dive Lounge theme was arranged and performed by Robert Acorn based on the original composition by Ryan Blaney. The Deep Dive microcast is a production of of Automaton Studios. Mm -hmm.